The demographic transition model separates the societal evolution into four distinct stages or phases based roughly on what people are doing in this society for a living, which in turn affects how they live and how many kids they have and therefore total population of this place slash state slash tribe. Now, what's going to go into the input of looking and understanding this stuff? Uh, let's look at birth rate. We'll throw in that is how many people are being put into the society every year per thousand. Uh, and of course the death rate, which we'll show in red, how many people being sucked out of the society every year per thousand. And let's just jump in with both feet. Stage one, the pre-modern, uh, perhaps better named pre-history, pre-historical, certainly pre-civilization. And this is the stage that humanity found itself in for about a half million years. Uh, this hunter-gatherer phase, this nomadic phase where small bands of humans are traveling around the earth, uh, picking fruits and nuts and berries and hunting game. Uh, in this society, it's 100% rural, that is people living out in the sticks, because it's pre-civilization, man. It's pre-agriculture, it's pre-city, it's pre-everything. Uh, what do people do for a living? Uh, let's see, uh, they hunt and or gather, and life in this society is hard. It's tough. Uh, some years are good years and you find a lot of game or fruits and nuts. Some years they're lean years. It's not so good. People are really at the mercy of Mother Nature, the mercy of the elements. Uh, uh, the flu will kill you, uh, a flood will drown you, a lion will eat you. Man, this state sucks! Uh, in this stage, how would we describe the birth and or death rates? Well, the birth rates are extremely high and erratic. That is, a lot of babies are born per thousand people, maybe 35, maybe 45. And that's why it's erratic, because it's at the basis of Mother Nature's mercy. Uh, some years are good and there's lots of food, so more people get pregnant and they have more babies. Some years it's more lean, there's a drought and you don't have as much babies. And quite frankly, this parallels the death rate as well because it's a good year or a bad year. There's lots of death or there's not. A drought goes through or smallpox. A lot of people die one year, but the next year, hey, it was really awesome and everybody lived. So the death rate Rate and birth rate in this stage one society are both high and erratic. How does that affect the total population? Now, again, they have lots of babies per thousand, but lots of people die per thousand too. So the overall population total is actually quite low. Uh, the fertility rate is exceptionally high. Most women in a stage one society would have 10, 12, 15 babies. They'll, they'll just have babies one after the other their entire adult life. Uh, why? Well, because there's no contraception for one. And why wouldn't you? We're bored, we have sex, you just keep doing it. And you need a lot of kids to have a big, vibrant, healthy tribe to keep things going. On top of that, and most crucial, infant mortality is exceptionally high. Most kids are not going to live to see that first birthday. There is the expectation of people that you're going to have 10 kids because half of them are going to kick the bucket. In this same scenario, longevity rates are very low. That is, life expectancy, of course, is very low because not only do lots of babies die in their first year or their first several years uh, because life's tough, but old people don't stick around long either. Uh, they're the first to go in times of drought or when there's a food shortage. No, you don't feed granny first. You feed the vibrant younger people who are going to go out and hunt and collect food. Uh, and also, uh, granny would be cheetah bait in this scenario. When a cheetah attacks the tribe, everybody hauls ass and granny runs the slowest so the cheetah gets granny while the rest of us live. Bye bye granny. It was nice knowing you. Now, where do societies like this exist on planet Earth right now? Uh, not really anywhere. There are no states we would point to and say, hey, that's a stage one society. Not really. This, this whole idea of people living this way is kind of going the way of the dodo. You don't have a state that's a phase one society, but you would have small bands of people perhaps in some states, uh, namely, say, some indigenous tribes in the deep rainforest of Brazil 
or the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So there are small groups of people who may still live this way, but even those guys are dwindling fast. There's just not that many people who live and die uh, this way anymore. Most folks have evolved their society into a different stage, and let's get to that one now. It's stage two, and we're gonna call this one urbanizing industrial phase two, and this one's hardcore. Uh, because we're going to pack a hell load of human existence into this one phase. A bunch of societal changes over the course of perhaps 8,000 years. We're going to pack it all and call it stage two. Uh, what do people do in a stage two society? Well, it's going to include everything from the advent and dawn of agriculture. So people are going to go from hunter-gatherers to sedentary, settle down, agriculturalist, Farmers growing lots of food. In fact, their food source will increase. It'll be stable year after year. They'll get more food and it, they get it every year. So it's a stable situation. Uh, but we're also going to evolve out to society another several thousand years uh, all the way to factory workers. I know, it's a big stretch. But you're going to start with the dawn of civilization, uh, with the agriculturalist, and then they're going to have villages, and then the, those villages will turn into towns, and then cities, and societies will become more complex, and job specialization will occur, where you'll have tinsmiths, and herdsmen, and priests, and kings, and that will continue on all the way until more modern times, where you have industrialization, and people uh, making factories which make stuff and mechanization and machines making machines and people work in the factories to make stuff. All of that we're going to pack into this just this stage two. In this scenario what's going on besides the occupations that people have? Uh, well most people still live in what we would call a rural area particularly at the beginning of stage two where most people are farmers everyone's living in the sticks very very small percentage of people would live in an urbanized city area. As stage two progresses though, as you go from early stage two to late stage two, more and more people start to move to cities. They get bigger, okay? But still, overwhelmingly, people live in rural areas. Uh, how has life gotten better for people, or has it? Yeah, it's gotten much better. Uh, that's because now you have a stable and increasing food supply year after year. You have increasing technologies across the board, and technology just don't mean computers. Uh, technology means advances in anything. Advances in agriculture, advances in medical technology, advances in weapon technology. All of this occurs in stage two, uh, and a lot of it occurs. So more food, stable food supply, uh, even the advent of, say, refrigeration and food storage, which makes even even more food lasts longer, it's awesome. And technological increases in understanding health issues, so increased sanitation, and man, having a clean water supply and sanitation will keep droves of people alive, really improve the quality of life. Increases in health care, so people start to understand sicknesses and disease and can treat them. But also increase in technology in terms of architecture, building better shelters, increased safety standards so stuff doesn't fall down. All of this basically is increasing human control over Mother Nature. They're no longer at the mercy of elements. Yes, Mother Nature can send a tornado your way and you're screwed. But increasingly, humans are controlling their environment and making it better so they can keep themselves alive longer and in greater numbers. Even weapon technology is important to consider that in stage one, when the cheetah came after us and it got granny, we couldn't do much about it. At stage two, we'll develop some weapons uh, all the way to guns. And now when the cheetah comes after us, bam, we got the cheetah. Welcome back to the fold, granny. So all of these things happen in this broad swath of societal evolution we call stage two, and how does it affect the rates? Well, to start, the birth rate doesn't really change that much. People are still having lots of babies. However, it does stabilize. It kind of flatlines. The rate is high. Lots of kids born every year per thousand people, but it's not fluctuating as wildly as it was. And that, that's because, again, humans are controlling their environment more. With a stable food supply and killing the cheetahs and everything else, it's stable. Every year those kids are born and it's cool they're still here. Here's what's much more fascinating. The death rate absolutely plummets like you cannot believe. Just bottoms out. People are not dying like they used to. So birth rates high and stable, death rates absolutely plummet. Why? For all the reasons we talked about. Life gets better, there's more food for more people, we have weapons, we have medicine, we got all this great stuff and people stay alive in droves like never before. Uh, and particularly when you're talking about infant mortality, we can keep all those children alive a lot longer once you invent vaccines and have healthcare and lots of other things. 
All of this taken together means the overall population, to population total absolutely explodes. Kablammo! Because when you have death rates plummet, nobody's dying anymore like they used to, but birth rate's still high, you have a bunch more people coming into the society than are getting sucked out every year. So total population starts to go through the roof. Fertility rates remain exceptionally high, which kind of defies this. It's like, why, why would people keep having babies? Uh, well, kids are an asset still. Remember, in stage one, uh, the kids are out there helping pick berries or their cheetah bait, okay? Even in early stage two, in agricultural settings, children are valued as an asset because agriculture is labor intensive. You need a lot of people working on the farm, so you have a big family. And even in the early industrializing phases of stage two, Children work in factories. I know, it's not fun. It still happens in today's world. It happened a lot more several hundred years ago. Send the kids to go work in the rug factory in India. Not a problem. They're only three years old. That's okay. We'll only pay them half. It'll all even out. So children are seen as an asset for labor on the farm and even in the indu uh, early industrial factories. And more importantly, they're staying alive a hell of a lot more than they used to. Remember, Back in stage one, you know, granny had 10 kids and five of them died. Uh, and then your mom, maybe she had 10 kids and only three of them died. And now here you are in stage two, full on, you have 10 kids and all 10 of them are still alive. Little bastards, they're all still here and you gotta feed them. So you see that things are changing in the society, but the mentality of folks is still in stage one or early stage two. They're still thinking like things are the way they were. And every year that goes by, people are like, well, all my kids are still alive. It's just a very good year. It's just a very good, we just had a good crop. It's just a good year. But you never know, next year could be bad. And that bad year never comes. Now, where on planet Earth can we see stage two societies? A lot of Africa, we could point at stage two and say, yeah, places like Kenya or lots of other places, uh, in Africa that are early stage two, still in this transition. Most people are still farmers. Some people are starting to go to the factory. Uh, but places in Southeast Asia like Vietnam, late stage two, uh, Guatemala and Central America, lots of places that we consider kind of underdeveloped are, are, are mid to late stage two, right? Because most places on planet Earth have now gotten on to stage three. Let's do it ourselves, shall we? The mature industrial phase. Most places on planet Earth would now be somewhere in this realm. Some late stage two, most stage three. The mature industrial phase is a continuation of all of the trends we saw in stage two, just ramped up even more. So what are people doing for a living? Ah, uh, well, there's still some farmers, but increasingly farming is going away too, and fewer and fewer people are doing it because it's become mechanized. Because people in the industrial phase now have a tractor. So you don't need a big family, you don't need a bunch of people to do it, and a handful of people can produce a lot more food. So there's still a lot of farmers, but they're starting to slide in percentage of people that are doing it. A lot more people are now in the industrial sector working in factories, producing stuff, automobiles or televisions or whatever. Uh, and on top of that, job specialization is increasing even more. A lot more people are joining what we call the service sector, doing service sector jobs. So there's a lot more uh, policemen or lawyers or doctors or graphic designers or civil servants. A lot more of this starts to come into play in stage three. And the later you get in stage three, the more job specialization and service sector stuff is going on. Where do people live in this stage? Increasingly, people live in the big city. That's where all the action is. That's where people want to be. And in fact, please note this. That's one of the big differences between stage two and stage three. Stage two, over half the people are still in a rural area, probably an agricultural setting, still the majority. When you tip the balance into stage three is when now 50% or more of your society is living in a full on urbanized area, probably working in the industrial sector or the service sector, living in a big city. Again, why would people wanna live in a big city? Why do you wanna live in a big city? That's where the stuff is. That's where the urbanized industrial sector is. That's where the service sector is. That's where the jobs are so people move to the city. And that's where the amenities are. That's where the education and great schools are and doctor's offices and movie theaters and Ferrari dealers. That's why people move to the city. And all of these things continue to make the society more complex, but also make life better for individuals. 
There are further increases across the board in all the same stuff we talked about, food production and food storage, but also healthcare advances get insane at this point. Like crazy insane. Now, what am I talking about? Crazy insane? In stage three, as you continue through stage three, this mature industrial, you have something called 911, which I know you take for granted, but consider this, most of the planet don't got that. If you cut off your arm in an accident, in a stage three society, you can press 911, and somebody will come in an ambulance and help you. And they'll take you to a hospital and they'll reattach your arm. What? That is crazy. In stage one, if you cut off your arm, bam, there it is, and you're dead. Uh, in stage two, probably you'll suffer before you die. In stage three, they can save your life. And not only that, they can transplant your heart, man. Wow. Or your liver if you drink too much. So increases in metal technology really get crazy and keep a lot more people alive too. The other very significant thing that increases during stage three is education. Couple ammo. That's what you're getting right now too. And as education increases, this wildly impacts the society and how many kids they have, especially when you're talking about women. And of course, I love talking about women, but in this context, it's very important. As you educate your society further, and as a mature industrial society evolves, education becomes more available to more people, uh, and further levels of it become available to more people. So instead of just getting K through five, uh, most people will get through high school in a stage three, and in late stage three, they'll get through high school and college. And back to the women, if you educate women in any society, it has an exact one-to-one -one effect on fertility rate and numbers of kids being born. What? How can I make such a bold claim? Because it's true and it's proven time and time and time again. When you educate women, several things happen simultaneously which bring down fertility rates big time. Like what? Uh, well, as women get educated, uh, they are educated about birth control. Oh, they're educated about their bodies and about health issues and family planning and that you can take this little pill and not have a baby right now if you don't want. Oh, that is wild. And you go around the world and say, hey, ladies, I got these pills you can have and you won't have babies. People be like, give me that. All right. Controlling family size is very important and that comes with education and access to health care, but education first. More importantly, or as importantly, as women become further and further educated, they then are more career oriented. They go into the workforce more. They do not stay at home and have kid after kid after kid after kid like they did in stage one and early stage two. They want a career first. So they delay marriage and delay family creation. And when you delay family creation a decade or so, you ultimately shrink the total family size because you just won't have time to have kids if you wait a decade or two to have them. So educating women. As the education of women goes up, the fertility rate of a society goes down. One to one curve. And let's look at those rates now. How does all this affect the rates in stage three? As might be expected, because of the advances in medical technologies and increasing lifespans and the uh, decreasing infant mortality because of medicine and vaccines, death rates do continue to decline. But look at the curve. They're not declining as fast as they were back in stage two. And that's for perhaps obvious reasons. Back in stage two, when you improve the quality of your water and sanitation, you will keep millions more people alive and death rate plummets. In stage three, yes, reattaching an arm, having a kid's vaccination, uh, having a heart transplant, that keeps people alive too, but not as much. Not millions, but thousands. So death rates continue to decline, but not as quickly. But watch this one. Wow, the birth rate really does completely bottom out and drops to meet the death rate very, very rapidly. And it happens for all of the reasons we've now mentioned increases in technology across the board, increases in quality of life across the board, increases in education, particularly education of women across the board, delays family planning, has women in the workforce. All of these factors together now take full effect and people stop having kids like they used to. And it is a serious, serious decline. Now I want to throw in one more term. In this interim period, this time lag where it takes the birth, the high birth rates of stage two and three to 
lower themselves down to the low death rates, the population explodes during this period for obvious reasons now, birth rates high, death rates low. We call this lag a cultural lag, and that's because it's taken the society some time to figure out what's going on here. And it's not even a conscious decision, by the way. It's simply that people have the mindset. They're still stuck, even in the mature industrial phase, in the early part of stage three, they're still stuck in the mindset that life is like it was a, a, a long time ago, that you're supposed to have big families, that, uh, that you need uh, children for labor, that they're a huge asset, that you're supposed to have a bunch of kids because half of them are gonna die. And people just, because of tradition, continue to have lots of kids, and it's not, uh, it's not a conscious decision. People aren't sitting around saying, oh, well, have we, what stage of, so of society are we in? Are we in stage three? I should stop having children. And, uh, it just happens naturally that people slowly start to figure out, oh man, I'm having all these kids and they're still alive and they cost money. I live in the city now. I don't need these kids out in the hay fields. They're not doing anything. They're costing me. Things are starting to change culturally and people kind of wake up very slowly over time due to this cultural lag. They finally get over it in stage three. The lag's done and things have significantly changed. Stage three, sum up on what's changed. Birth rates decrease rapidly. Death rates are decreasing, but much slower. Overall population is still increasing, but not as quickly as it was back in stage two. Fertility rates absolutely plummet. Women will not have that many babies over the course of their lifetime. Why? Because kids now suck. Uh, they used to be an asset. They used to help pick berries or work on the, in the fields. They're not doing any of that anymore. They're just picking their nose playing video games. And increasingly, they're costing you lots and lots of money. You gotta take them to McDonald's for a Happy Meal, and you gotta buy them a car and send them to college. And some kids don't leave the house until they're 30 or 40 years old now. Huge investment financially, but also time-wise, that parents have for each child in a stage three society. So they increasingly wake up to the fact that I don't want a bunch. I can't afford to send 10 kids to college. I can do one. And of course, because infant mortality is very low, you have the, the expectation that people are gonna die is gone. All people expect their kid, all of their kids to stay alive. For all of these reasons, fertility rates dump. All right, longevity of course increases because of advances in medical technology. And let's look around the world, where are some stage three societies? This is actually a fairly diverse, it's, even though it's one category, it seems like a fairly succinct amount of time. Uh, there's a big difference between an early stage three and a late stage three state. So if a state has a lot of farmers still and a lot of people in industrial capacity to are working in factories, and family size is still high, they'd be early stage three. Uh, and you can look around lots of parts of the world, a lot of parts of Africa, uh, of Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East are in this kind of category, still high family size, uh, industrializing societies that are on the change. Uh, but when you get to a late stage three, ah, now you're looking at places that are getting close to what you're familiar with here in America. Uh, places like Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, these are definitely late, mid to late stage three, kind of fully advanced societies, not quite as rich as some Western European or American states. Uh, however, we'd also throw China in there. And China's getting, uh, they're right on that edge. They're, they're stage three, they're kind of developed. They got all the stuff we just talked about and all the population rates, birth rates and death rates are like the United States. So maybe China already is pushed over into our final stage Four. Stage four is called the post-industrial. Yeah, okay, so you're agriculturalist, then you're industrialist, now you're post-industrialist, you're something else. And how would we categorize these societies? What do people do here? Almost nobody's in farming anymore, right? In America, 2% of people are farmers. They provide the food for the other 98%, and we export a bunch of stuff too. Uh, so very few farmers, very few people working in coal mines or any, any jobs like that. Uh, there's actually decreased industrialized work too. Not that many people working in factories. Remember, it's post-industrial, so a declining percentage of people in industry either. 
overwhelmingly in a post-industrial society, people are working in that service sector, in sales, information technologies, as teachers, as civil servants, the whole nine yards, pretty much everything, every job you've ever had in America and every job of anybody you've ever known in America is probably service sector. That's what they do. Uh, and most people kind of have desk jobs, not very active, not out cutting down trees. You're working in an office setting. Where do people in this society live? Overwhelmingly urban settings. 70, 80, 90% of people live in a city or a significantly sized town or city. That's where people are. Nobody's in the sticks. Hardly anybody lives in rural areas. Very few people in agricultural settings. Things are pretty awesome in this society from a technological standpoint. The highest levels of technology in everything, in everything. And the stage four societies are the places where new technologies are being invented and created and modified. So everyone is sitting around, sipping lattes, has access to health care, makes good money, playing video games, driving sports cars. Uh, what happens to the rates in a stage four society? And this becomes exceptionally easy. They pretty much bottom out and meet each other. Both the birth rates and death rates per thousand are very low. Not that many babies being born into the society. Not that many people dying in the society year after year after year. And because they are on equal playing levels now, death rate and birth rate about the same, that means the overall population is stable. It has stabilized high. It's a high population total, but it's not really growing. It's not exploding in growth anymore. It might be growing, but very slowly going up, if at all. It might be stable. Uh, so birth rate's low, death rate's low, overall population total is stable. Fertility rate's very low. Uh, kids are expensive and they all stay alive and they don't move out to their 40s, so people only have a couple few kids tops. And longevity rates are increasingly higher and higher and higher in stage four because now they've invented things called old folks homes. So whereas you used to die of something a long time ago, now you can be treated in perpetuity for your disease. And even when your family gets tired of you, they stick you into a home where they'll sit you down there and you can sit there for an exceptionally long time until you die. Thanks for being cheetah bait a long time ago, Granny. Now we're gonna put you in this home and you can sit there until you're 100. So longevity increases. And in all of these circumstances, these are now familiar settings to probably everybody watching this video. Where are countries like this? Uh, the USA, the United Kingdom, uh, actually United Arab Emirates in the Middle East, uh, Singapore, Australia, rich countries. That, they're the ones that live like this. Let me go back to fertility rates though. What happens if fertility rates are even lowered? Yes, to finish up, that's what I wanted to get to in a possible stage Five. And this is a questionable one. You won't see this in too many textbooks, but it's increasingly happening. And a stage five country is where death rates are death rates. We can't get them any lower. That they just, that's it. All right. People are dying. We can keep them alive to 100, put them in old folks home, but that's it. Okay. But the birth rates are getting lower than the death rates. People are now having fewer and fewer and fewer children year after year, which means that the death rate is higher than the birth rate. That's important because that means your total population gets smaller. It's shrinking every year. If every couple gets together and only has one kid, right? Two people get together and have one kid, and then that kid goes out and meets somebody and they have one kid, you see where the size of the total population is going to get smaller year after year after year. And that may be getting dangerous. And quite frankly, it's brand new on the world stage. There was no country a hundred years ago was getting smaller, but they are now. People in some parts of the planet just like their lifestyle so much, they don't want to have kids. They don't want to get interrupted with that. Places like Russia, uh, Japan, Italy, actually many Western European countries have birth rates that are below the death rates in their country. And again, play it out in the long term. That means their country population is getting smaller year after year after year. Does that mean the country will disappear? Nobody knows. This has never happened before, which is why I like to throw in that possible stage five. Now to finish, looking back at our entire model, all the stages and all these birth and death rates over time, let's superimpose what happens to total population, which we've kind of been talking about this entire time. Total population from stage one is low, but it quickly explodes in stage two, starts to taper off, but still growing in stage three. 
and stabilizes flatlines in stage four, but flatlines at a very high number. Again, this is total population, not a rate. And in that possible stage five, total population will start to go down. What else happens over the course of this demographic transition? Uh, things that increase from stage one through stage five, there are increasing urbanization rates, increasing industrialization, increasing technology across the board, increasing education, increasing health care, increasing life expectancy. At the same time as you go from pre-modern to post-industrial, you have decreasing infant mortality and ultimately decreasing fertility rate. People ain't having kids like they used to. Now, knowing all of this, how societies generally have evolved over time, uh, we can better understand the mechanisms of population growth in different countries around the world. Uh, and more importantly, we can make predictions of how things are going to go down in the future. This is a decent little model. Again, you don't have to buy it. It is a theory. Some people don't. But it's pretty good and answer a lot of questions about why there's lots of folks here, maybe not so much here, and why is there they growing faster here and growing slower here. We can also check out the demographic status of individual states in a handy little tool called a population pyramid, and we'll turn to that next.